Hello folks and welcome to today's webinar, Integrating Composting into Your Farming Business with Ellen Polishuk, who you should be able to see on your screens. Go ahead and wave, Ellen. Uh, this is the second webinar in the On-Farm Composting and Compost Use webinar series. I'm Linda wilson Brolis of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance's Composting for Community Initiative, and I'll be your host for today. Uh, I wanted to give a quick shout out to a couple of my ILSR colleagues who are helping with this series. Sophia Jones will be providing technical support throughout the webinar. And Clarissa Libertelli is a talented artist who's creating beautiful artwork for our composting initiative, including this beautiful graphic here. So thank you both. Uh, for those not familiar with our work, ILSR's Composting for Community Initiative is advancing composting to reduce waste, enhance local soils, create community development opportunities, and protect the climate. Our focus is to catalyze distributed food waste composting options that include home, community, and on-farm scales. You can find out more about our work and peruse our wealth of resources, including reports, infographics, webinars, podcasts, and a policy library and map on our website. If you go to ilsr.org forward slash composting, uh, you'll see a composting resources drop down menu on the right hand side of your screen and from there you'll be able to select reports, podcasts, webinars and more. So check that out. Uh, this series is being brought to you through the through our involvement with the Million Acre Challenge of which I is a founding member. The Million Acre Challenge is a collaborative project with the mission of advancing regenerative agriculture on one million agricultural acres in the mid-Atlantic region. In our first webinar, uh, the project director of the Million Acre Challenge, Amanda Cather, gave an overview of the project's six working groups, which are science, farmer engagement, public outreach, policy, diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, and business case. In a moment, uh, we'll hear a little bit more about the activities and goals of the business case working group. Um, the next webinar in this series will be on October 5th and will feature author and composting educator and consultant, James McSweeney. He'll do a deep dive into developing recipes based on materials commonly found on farms with a special consideration for adding food scraps to the mix. You can register for that session and check out the rest of the lineup uh, on our website. The series goes through uh, December 7th, I believe. So now let's get to know each other with a little, uh, with a few interactive polls. All right, so first question, where are you participating from? You should be able to see the polls in your control panel. So first option, Northeastern US, Southern US, Midwestern US, Western US, and outside of the US. I don't think we have anybody from outside, but just in case. And just a moment more. All right, big majority from the northeastern U.S., but a good chunk from the southern U.S. and a little bit from the midwestern U.S., so welcome to everyone. All right, another question. Are you composting? Are you currently composting? Yes, already composting. No, but I'm interested in starting. No, but I'm interested in supporting others in composting and then other. Alrighty, just another moment. Okay, results are in. Uh, majority are already composting, that's awesome. Um, but we have a good mix of folks that are interested in starting or supporting others in starting. That's fantastic, welcome to you all. I'm curious what the other category is. Feel free to add it to the chat so we know. And the final question, what best de describes your affiliation? Just, I know you uh, answered this question at registration, but just so we all know, we can see who's participating. All right, just another moment. Let's check out the results. All right. 
39% farmers, that's fantastic. Good chunk of just composters. And then I know research government or nonprofit is a big, uh, there's a lot of things lumped together there. So apologies for that. Great. And a few other businesses or other. So welcome to everyone. Now that we know each other a little bit better, let's go ahead and introduce uh, my colleague at the Million Acre Challenge, uh, Arjun Makiani. Uh, he's the president of the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research, which is also a founding member of the Million Acre Challenge. Arjun is the lead for the Million Acre Challenge's business case working group. So he's gonna share a little bit about that now. So Arjun, I'm gonna give you the mic. So go, go ahead. Thank you. Uh... Sophia, could you give me my first slide, please? Thank you. So there's my address, email address, and my phone number in case you want to reach me. Next slide. Yeah, so here are the issues um, as I see them so far. I've been working on this for a year and a half, nearly two years now. Little is known about the transition costs and risks for taking up regenerative practices, especially bundles of practices. Um, and especially the end point is non-organic commodity crop. The big problem is that in contrast to organic crops, there's no price bump at present for healthy soils practices as such. Organic, yes, of course, as you know. Um, financing via carbon offset payments from corporations is inappropriate for climate. It's, does, um, it also raises environmental justice issues. And we have data only from six to mostly, almost all from six to eight inch deep soil samples, whereas really the data should go down between 60 centimeters and one meter to know about carbon and climate. So this is a huge issue. Um, we need public support for transition to healthier soils, so we do agriculture better. Uh, that's sort of the conclusion from that carbon offset payments aren't going, aren't appropriate for this. That was a starting point, but uh, not where we are currently. Uh, we need transition cost data. Currently, we only have cover crop and low till, no till data. And um, really, we need data for bundles of practice, and um, including composting. And maybe that's so many of you are already composting. We need to help us, and I welcome that, um, especially for green crops. Next slide. We are of course trying to develop this data. Uh, uh, it says four avenues, and there are two other bullet points. Um, Currently, I think agrivoltaics on a small fraction of the farm, say five or 10% of the farm, with that part of the solar also being used for agriculture, like grazing sheep, um, can support the transition in agriculture for the whole farm because the profits from lease revenues or owning solar are much, much greater than commodity crops. I've done a report. I'll put it in the chat right after I finish so you can download the report um, on agrivoltaics. A farm, this is a farm-centered report, not solar producing. Regenerative organic transition, there's a price delta and that is the key and we're exploring that. Um, we'll produce, um, commissioned a report on it, which we hope to publish well before the end of the year. Um, and being on the ILSR website, you'll see that. Um, economic resilience, I think, is a very important thing. We have evidence that um, in times of drought, for example, farms can be saved because they have higher yields and they don't fall completely down. In, and we have more and more severe weather, of course, because of uh, uh, climate disruption. Diversification is important and all these areas data is, is an issue. Uh, we need policy support and financing for transition to healthy soils practices. And one question we're exploring is, is insurance similar to crop insurance, but insuring healthy soils practices in case your yields fall or you have you know a learning curve for a few years, that might be an important policy support. 
Thank you. Oh, oh, I have one more slide. Um, we are developing a template, a, a spreadsheet template for commodity crops. We have one for vegetable crops that's close, and we would welcome volunteers for beta testing any of this stuff, uh, uh, especially among mm, those of you who are farmers who are already composting, because composting, in my view, and of course, I listen to is a very important part of uh, regenerative and healthy soil. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Arjun, for that. Thank you. Thank you for the time. Absolutely. Um, so uh, you all will get a copy of this recording at the end of the webinar. So you'll be able to see Arjun's contact information if you want to reach out to him. Uh, but we thought that uh, hearing a little bit about the business case working group of the Million Acre Challenge would fit in really well to our feature presentation um, on topic of integrating composting into your farming business um, as Arjun is working to help quantify the benefits of regenerative practices so that we can also help farmers in transitioning to regenerative practices. So thank you Arjun for that overview. And so now, uh, before we begin our feature presentation, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, you all probably have noticed that you're in listen-only mode. Um, we will be stopping periodically throughout Ellen's presentation to address questions, so please enter your questions as they come up into the GoToWebinar control panel box. It should be on your screen. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, and you will be sent a copy afterwards. Um, there's also a handout of the presentation available um, that you should be able to download. So with that, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Ellen is a first-generation sustainable vegetable farmer and holds a degree in horticulture from Virginia Tech. Actually, I'm going to start handing things over to you, Ellen, as I give your bio. Great, okay. Um, so she's a self-described compost queen and started her agricultural career as a summer with a summer farming job at age 16. In 1992, after several farm seasons and years in the vegetable seed business, she was hired by Potomac Vegetable Farms to manage their satellite farm in Virginia, which you'll hear about in a second. After 25 years at Potomac Vegetable Farms, where she was a co-owner and compost queen, she now consults and teaches full-time through a consultancy, Plant to Profit, specializing in sustainable agriculture, vegetable growing practices, and increasing farm profitability. So thank you, Ellen. Take it away. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, you sound great. Great, all right. Hey everybody, thanks for taking a siesta in the middle of the day and spending it with us here. Um, I don't have the ability to see any of your faces, which is a drag, but uh, please do use the chat to communicate with us about any issues you're having or especially questions. If we were live in person, I would want you to raise your hand right away. And I like to deal with questions kind of as they come so that you don't get stuck and forget and not be able to listen to the rest of the presentation. All right, so I'm gonna, this is farm scale composting. And as uh, was introduced, the farm that I had the vast majority of my agricultural experience on, is called Potomac Vegetable Farms. It's located in Northern Virginia. It has two locations, three female owners, a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of staff, and it grows using ecoganic methods, which are not certified organic. And the two farms put together uh, do about a million dollars in business. So in 1992, we're, this is the Wayback Machine. I mean, even that picture looks like it could be from the 30s or something. Uh, that's when I was hired full time to take on one of the two locations of Potomac Vegetable Farms. And this is what it looked like when I was there. Uh, maybe you can see that really old tricycle front end Oliver tractor struggling there on the right hand side of, your, of the photograph. But the whole property was farmed basically as one field. I mean, the, the part that was tilled. And 
it looks pretty scary, right? I was scared. This was a lot of land. And my job was to transition it from this into a thriving uh, organic vegetable farm. Um, just a couple more details about that property. And as you can tell from the photograph, this is a newer picture and this is more what it looks like at this point, not just one big field, but really 30 small fields. The whole property is 180 acres. Um, of that, 50 acres is inside of the deer fence, which is a crucial, crucial part of production. Of the 50 acres inside the fence, only 20 are tilled or in production. And of those 20, at any given moment, only half of that 20 will be growing vegetable crops. The other half is on vacation. And that's a whole other long story that I love to talk about in other uh, presentations, but not for today. And that farm out of those 10 acres of cash crops usually produces around $400,000 worth of vegetables and herbs and a little bit of cut flowers. And then this Loudoun County location is also where the composting happened. So I'm gonna share with you my journey as a composter and lots of good pictures. So here's a little, uh, just the first definition, well, that is not what I wanted to have happen, there we go, of what composting is. It's the aer aerobic biodegradation of organic matter under controlled conditions. The key word in all of this here is aerobic and controlled conditions. That's the kind of composting I'm gonna talk about today. Why would someone bother to get into composting, and I'm speaking from a farmer's perspective. Uh, the reason why I got involved in composting is because I was advised by wise people that that would be the, the best path to regenerate that farm. Um, so that's a whole long and really good story that I'd love to tell you over some beers, but let's just put it this way. Uh, I was in contact with a guy and he said, I can sell you something in a bag and I could sell you something in a bucket, but what you really need is to learn how to make your own compost. And so that was the beginning of my journey of learning how to, to regenerate this property using uh, compost. So that's reason number one, that's my reason. For some people, it can be a nice little side business to sell finished compost. For lots of farms, uh, composting is a way of handling manure. And so they have animal operations are generating all kinds of manure and they need to be able to do something with it. And composting is one of the options. And then in some very specific situations, it's possible that you could become an actual waste handling facility whereby you would getting you would be making money by charging tipping fees to have people bringing you compostable uh, materials but reason number one i'm assuming is the reason why all the farmers are on this call today so why is compost such a great thing why did that guy from midwest biosystems tell me that i needed to learn how to make compost Compost, its first beauty is that it's a, it's a microbial inoculant and a delivery system for nutrients. So there's nutrients in the compost itself and it's in a very stable form so that they're there when, you, when the plants need them. It is an organic matter addition and a very highly broken down organic matter addition. And there's also some, I might call them magical properties of a really good compost in that it can be a way of neutralizing poisons or toxins that are in the soil and other harmful compounds. So those are some of the reasons why compost is such a great thing on a farm. Here, here's to sum that up in maybe more in a, in a different 
image. So maybe this is helpful. I think of, I always break this, the idea of soil down into these, the three categories of biology, physics, and chemistry. So in the biological department, we have the microbial inoculant itself of the good compost, and we have the organic matter addition, which is then food for biology that's in the soil. From the physics or physical aspects of the soil, we have again this organic matter addition that shows up always, and it will help with, with uh, aiding aggregation. And then from a chemistry perspective, yeah, there's minerals in that compost. And so that counts as a fertilizer amendment. And then there's the neutralization down here as well. So in 1994, yeah, as I told you, I was, I was mandated to learn to make compost or that our farm, somebody needed to learn how to make compost. And out of all the people on staff, I seemed to be the one who was excited. I felt the call, shall we say, that it was my thing to learn how to make compost. And so what I did is I was told that the Lubkis from Austria were the best composters in the world and were out teaching week-long classes uh, for farmers on how to compost. And so I took a class in 1994 this week-long class, and my partners at Potomac Vegetable Farms, of course, were supporting me in all of this. And this is the very first compost machine that we bought. And as you can see, it's really weird, right? Because it's a self, uh, it's not pulled by a tractor, it, it's self-moving. Uh, and, you know, you drive it like a skid loader with your hands on these buttons. And it was, the whole thing was handmade by Amish people in Pennsylvania. How's that for pretty weird? Okay, so that's the beginning. Let's talk about making compost. So and actually, Ellen, to yeah. inter interrupt you before we get into the yeah. uh, compost process, some questions that have come up. Um, first one, are, is there any literature you'd recommend uh, regarding the abilities of compost to neutralize toxic compounds? Um, I don't have anything at my fingertips, but uh, but I can point in a direction, but I, I would have to do it offline. Yes, yep. uh, I think we might have something to share as well. We'll, we'll come back to that. Sorry okay. to put you on the spot for that. Um, but has Potomac Vegetable Farm uh, farms during your time or now uh, distributed any compost to other farms? We have sold little bits of compost to our neighboring farms to my uh, Barbara at, at um, Flower Farm, a little bit to Robert Schubert, just, yeah, people right nearby, but not very much, you know, like 1% of, of all of our production. Great. And uh, perhaps you'll get into these things, so just let me know, um, but the, the makeup of the compost. Oh, yeah, that's that coming. That you used and the results on the crops that you've experienced. Mm. Yeah, good. Let's, you might need to remind me about that, but I'm going to write a note. Okay. All right. Cool. Let's make some compost. All right. So the easiest way to keep this organized in your mind is to think of the biology in the compost pile as livestock, like cows. They're just like cows or chickens and they need the basics of life. They need air, water, food, and shelter. Okay, and when we say air, we're specifically interested in oxygen because remember compost is an aerobic decomposition. And so all the critters, that's what I call them, all the microbes are the, the ones that we're going to encourage are aerobic microbes, meaning they breathe in oxygen and they exhale carbon dioxide, just like us, just like cows, just like chickens. So in order to deal with this issue of oxygen, which is used up incredibly quickly by these microbes, that's why the turning machine exists. Uh, you saw slides last, last uh, webinar about all other kinds of systems of, of trying to make sure to get oxygen into the pile. I'm gonna only talk about this this windrow system with a turning machine but that's the main job of the turning machine 
when we talk about water, this is important, just like in your soils and you're managing your crops, you want just the right amount of water. So these are critters that need water. You need just the right amount. I'll show you pictures of how we manage water by add it, being able to add it and being able to make sure it doesn't get rained out by using really nice compost covers. The food, of course, are the materials themselves and the shelter that the microbes need is going to also be the materials themselves is what they're going to live inside of. And then we also have compost covers, which again, I'll show you briefly. So the specifics of this style of composting, and I would, I would compare it to yoga, right? There's a lot of branches or styles of yoga, Yengar and Kundalini and Hatha, and they have a lot, lot, lot in common. And they have just a couple things specific to them that are different enough, they get to be called a style. So I'm composted in the Lubke method. Those are my teachers. And the, the patented or copyrighted name of the kind of this style of compost was is called controlled microbial composting. It's not humongously popular in the United States, but it's very popular in Europe where the Lubkeys were in Austria and all over Europe now. So our goal in CMC compost is to make the best quality, most stable, finished compost and to do it quickly. Because we're farmers, quality is, our, is the driving feature, okay? And so we're gonna use a windrow system, we're gonna use a turning machine, we're gonna use compost covers, and then here's a piece that's kind of specific to the Lubke method. Always adding clay to the pile, five to 10% of the pile being clay. Doesn't have to be beautiful topsoil, it can be bright red Virginia clay. Any kind of soil is, works for this piece. We're gonna manage this pile pretty intensively by taking its temperature and monitoring the oxygen and carbon dioxide. And we have very strict uh, parameters around what makes a compost finished. And that means it has to be below 90 degrees and to be having just a very slow breathing pattern. And so our goal is to do all of this in eight to 10 weeks, which is pretty quick for the quality that, of compost we're gonna get. What equipment did we need to do this or do we use now still? We need the turning machine. We need a place to do this work. We need this monitoring equipment. We need a, a, a skid loader or a tractor with a bucket to build, construct those piles. And we need the compost covers themselves. All right, so here's some pictures. So this is the, the Turner that we ended up with, not that crazy one that you saw earlier, the self-propelled one. This is a tractor pulled version. This is a Sandberger Turner from Switzerland. Needless to say, it was not totally cheap, but there are used ones around. And there's a company, Midwest Biosystems uh, in Illinois, uh, Illinois, that is it makes Turners just, just like this. Here's it from the other view coming towards us. So you can see how the turning, uh, the turner is offset from the pile, from the tractor, I mean. All right, let's talk about that place. So that's the turner. Let's talk about the compost pad. Here's the features that are important. And I'm gonna show you pictures so it all makes sense. The compost pad needs to be flat from side to side with a 3% slope going the length of the piles. The reason is when it rains, we want the water to hit the pad and run out parallel to the piles and down to the end. We don't want water to flow into the, the whole, that long side of the pile and soak it. We need something there 
to be able to have decent traction in, in bad weather, whether that's gravel or pavement is up to your budget. We need easy access to water because we will need to water some piles at some times, depending on the weather and the time of year and your materials. We need enough space in the area in order to store all the materials because we're going to make compost all at once, all in one go, um, make each pile. And so we need to be able to collect up and hold those materials till we're ready to construct the pile itself which means also we need to have a really good driveway and an easy access for trucks to come and bring us those materials. So these are some fairly hefty demands, um, but they're important. And I think getting it right is gonna make everything work out much better in the end. So after 20 years of composting, this is remaking the pad that we had from the beginning. So we cleared off the old, uh, what was left behind. And this is uh, Mr. Broadus putting down a bunch of stone dust. So we put gravel down first, like four, three, four inches, and then a couple, three inches of, of stone dust on top, and then uh, graded it out. And this is the slope that I was talking about. So from side to side, it's flat, I think my camera is what's crooked. Um, and then the 3% slope is the length of the piles. And here's the material storage at various places around the edges. Here's a picture of somebody bringing me fill dirt so that you see how I need to have a good driveway and a good place for, some, for trucks to be able to get in and out without making a mess or getting stuck. Here's, uh, this isn't from my farm. This is obviously from an Amish farm. Somehow they are using, or maybe it's a Mennonite farm, using uh, a skid loader to build the piles. So I don't have any good pictures of my own using the skid loader. I don't know why, but this, this is, gives you the idea of how we're gonna build this pile is one bucket at a time, all the way down the windrow. Skid loaders are easy to find. And they're way, way better and faster and easier to use than a tractor with a bucket on the front, mostly because they take up so little space. It's so fast to turn around and go fetch the next bucket full. Let's talk about those compost covers. So we used uh, a material called TopTex. This photograph, of course, says Compotex. Other people have other ones. Basically, it's a Gore-Tex fabric, just like the they made rain gear out of. So it's breathable in the sense that uh, some water vapor can get out and some air, mole you know, different molecules can exchange through the cover, but it repels water. So the rain is kept off of the pile. This is sort of the most bummer part of, of this style of composting is dealing with these covers because, dude, they get heavy. So the piles are 150 feet long and the cover is, is 10 feet wide. So that's quite a, a job is taking that cover on and off each time you need to turn the pile. But what it does for us is so important that you just got to do it anyway. Too bad. So that's what the compost cover looks like in the picture. Here they are in a photograph. Um, here's Zach turning this pile over here. These were visitors from China a few years ago, um, but that's what they look like when they're in use. They are there. This is a picture from Switzerland where this is a self-propelled unit and it picks up the, tr the, the cover it has a unit to pick up the cover and then lay it back down so you don't have to do it by hand, but I never had one of those myself. And there's also one available for a tractor pulled model. Again, I never had one, but a golly, that seems like a good idea. Let's talk about, is there anything burning questions out there, Linda? I'm trying to find the unmute button. Um, so we do have a few questions that have come in. 
Um, do you, off the top of your head, know if there's a PFAS issue with the Gore-Tex cover? Uh, I don't. Okay. I haven't heard anything, but we could look into that as well. It'd be good to know. Um, how wide of a cover do you need for a 10 foot wide pile? I would imagine you need at least probably 14 feet. You'd have to do the math. That's a really wide pile. Just saying. <laughs> mm -hmm. What are the dimensions of the piles that you generally manage? Um, at the beginning of the, of the making they're probably four feet tall maybe a little bit more and then they shrink really fast as things start to break down they get denser and denser and the pile actually shrinks in half by in volume the weight stays the same all the ingredients are still there but all a lot all the spaces get smaller so it actually changes volume by half when all is said and done um, there's a question about if you have a recommendation for a smaller style skid steer um, for a smaller composting operation that produces something like 200 yards annually. Mm, yeah, that's pretty small. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not on that. Sorry. Okay. I think that's something that uh, ILSR might look. Uh, at some point have information on since a lot of community composters are working at that kind of scale yeah. so stay I tuned feel like i've seen things like that you know from a rental place you know things that homeowners can rent just to do a little projects around the house where you're actually like riding it like a mower almost um but i don't know anything about them Got it. um okay uh so there's a question about attracting pests through the storage of materials i don't know if uh like feedstock storage i, I don't know if you'll touch on that uh, no i has a best management practices guide that could be helpful i'll go ahead and um link to it in the yeah. chat most of my um, materials were not um attractive to more than just mice and there's mice anyway but i didn't have a rat i never once had a rat problem i didn't deal with food scraps so um i never had any problems yeah, and I think that that has to do with, I mean, the compost cover definitely helps and just active turning, um, right. keeping- but They're talking about storage, the materials stored on the side, which again, you could cover them as well. Or mm -hmm. you could, you know, some people who spend lots of money could make, you know, concrete areas to store stuff in, but we never did that. That is probably okay. more- Born with food scraps, I would imagine. Um, I think that's all for Good. right now. All right, uh, so, so let's, let's keep making this pile. Let's talk about materials. And uh, the guy last time, uh, Robert, uh, touched on this. I have our, the goal is to have 30 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio, which of course means absolutely nothing to you in your mind. Like, so what? You know, I could say 3,000 to 1, and, and, and it just doesn't, it's hard to get a handle on it until you start to um, study materials and what their carbon to nitrogen ratio is. So somehow your recipe needs to end up at 25 or 30 carbons for every one nitrogen. And we, we divide our materials into these, the brown or the dry materials or the high carbon materials are here on the left. And then on the right are the green or the wet nitrogen rich materials. So these are no, there's no secrets here. You know all this stuff hay, straw, paper, leaves, wood chips, tub ground. I got another picture of that. Corn stalks on the green or the, or the nitrogen rich side, manure, hay, if it's really high quality or it's a legume hay, would be a nitrogen addition. Uh, fresh green chopped weeds, grass, hay, food waste, there's grass clippings from yard waste, and dead bodies, they're considered. Actually, our bodies, I think, are about 25 
to to one seed and so we're the perfect ingredient <laughs> for composting um there's tables like this all over the internet so that you can find every kind of weird material coffee grounds you know corn cobs soybean meal and so that at least you have some idea about what the nature of your materials are but basically you're just going to have to figure this out by doing it you're going to try a, a recipe and then you're going to see how it goes and you're going to adjust it from there here's a shout out for all the woody material that's out there that's is fairly readily available um, and that is wood chips wood chips in compost in my world view doesn't work they're too big they're too woody there's not enough surface area for my style of composting to deal with those wood chips in eight to ten weeks ain't happening anybody who's going to work with wood chips is going to either have a months and months and months and months long process or they're going to have to sift them out that's not my style so if I wanted to work with wood chips, I would have to invest in a tub grinder. And this is a little, little teeny one. Meaning, so a wood chip is just like a slice of wood. A tub grinder is gonna squeeze that slice of wood and bust it open. We need to have more surface area available for the microbes to get in there and do their jobs. And, yeah, that's it for, for wood chips and me. We don't have a relationship because I never got a grinder. So here's the recipe that I ended up with that was the, in the last few years that I was at uh, Potomac Vegetable Farm. So on the carbon side, I would use hay and we bought it or we got it for free. It could be spoiled. It could be very poor quality. Who cares? Bring it. Poison ivy, weed seeds, I'll take it all uh municipal leaves from the town of leesburg that were delivered for free thank you very much and then the nitrogen component was some kind of manure i've used all kinds beef manure dairy manure chicken manure um, beef manure on straw was the most deluxe manure that i ever used you know you get into the finer points when you're working in a skid loader that pile of manure is what you know, two feet from your face. So you end up having a lot of opinions about manure and its qualities. Uh, we ended up with some dairy manure from uh, Jefferson, Maryland at the end. So those are the two typical ingredients, the carbon, the nitrogen. And then here's the other ingredients that are part of the Lubke method. And that would be the dirt, soil, and a little bit of finished compost from the last time. Of course, you don't have that at the beginning, but you will have it once you get started. So that's the ingredient, that's how it comes out in terms of scoops. So this is by the loader bucket. And here's the process of building the pile. So we bought big round bales and we unrolled them and then fluffed them up and kind of organized them. That's the first layer of the cake. Second layer, put on scoops of manure, just a continuous pile of manure so that it's homogeneous and equal throughout. And then we'll turn those two ingredients and mix them up nicely. Then we'll come and put on the rest of the ingredients, the leaves, the soil, other compost, and anything else you wanna throw in there. Turn the pile two more times. So at this point, the turning machine is acting as our mixer. That's what's mixing up our ingredients. And our goal is to get a 150 foot long windrow that's as homogeneous as we can get, that it's similar throughout. Then we're gonna put the covers on and we're gonna wait for about 24 to 36 hours. And at about 36 hours, somewhere in there, the pile should be getting into the 140s degrees, okay? It's that fast, which I think is like a miracle. Here's what that first turning looks like here with the, just the, the straw or the hay in the manure. Here we are um, adding all the other stuff. So there's leaves on here and then there's just junk, right? Just 
you know, garlic stems, rotten squash, weird vegetables, boxes, whatever. We're just going to throw it all in there and get and just include it as as little just to get rid of those scraps. And the machine just eats it all right up, no problem. And so the way we do this is that we build two piles at the same time, either the same day or one day after the other. Because remember how we were talking about how much volume we lose over time. So we make two piles at the same time, and after they've shrunk in half, then we push them together. And then they go through the second half of their life, two piles pushed into one. So that's 150 feet long, and that'll be about 100 or about 50 tons of compost will come out of that joint final windrow. That's a lot of compost. While we're, so part of this, this other important piece is us taking care of the pile as we go along. So this again, this is intensive. This is a pain in the neck. You aren't going to like this and uh, that's too bad. Okay. So first thing we're going to do is measure the carbon dioxide generated. We, there's no affordable farm scale oxygen meter. And so what we're going to do instead of measuring oxygen, which is what we really want to know, is we're going to measure the inverse, which is the carbon dioxide. So remember, the critters are breathing in oxygen, exhaling carbon dioxide. And when the pile reaches somewhere between 10 to 15 percent carbon dioxide, it means there's not enough oxygen there for the critters to breathe and they're going to start to die. Okay, so this is important. Uh, this is a, um, comes out of the HVAC industry, but this is a carbon, di a carbon dioxide meter. And here's what it looks like. We call it the bone because it's shaped like a bone. So we've got a probe that's going to go way into the pile. We're going to suck air out of the pile and introduce it into this device. And it's going to mix up with this crazy, stinky, weird pink liquid inside of there. And it's going to give us a reading. So every day, we're going to ask the pile, good morning, did you breathe up all your oxygen? And the answer for the first three weeks is, yes, I breathed up all the oxygen. Will you please bring me some new? Okay. So that's when we're going to turn the pile. Here we go. The reason why we're turning the pile is to lift it all up in the air. The carbon dioxide is going to squirt out the sides and oxygen from the ambient air is going to mix in with those materials and then it resettles down perfectly into this beautiful windrow. So the guy Robert last week said that turning machines are not aerators and I my eyes bugged out of my head and I'm going to respectfully disagree. That's the whole point of having a turning machine. The second thing we have to monitor is temperature. Our goal is to get to 150 degrees Fahrenheit and no more. Higher than that is too hot and it's going to kill off some of the good guys. Lower than 150, 149, it's not hot enough. It's not killing pathogens and weed seeds. So that's the magic number, 150, 149, 150. That's where we're going to go. And we're going to be there for a number of days, like three to six days. We're going to be that hot. All right, so you build this pile. You're learning about your ingredients. And you go out, and you're taking the temperature. And you go out after 36 hours and you say, oh my gosh, it's 165 degrees, this pile, it's too hot. What am I gonna do? Here's some of your choices. Is it also too dry? If it's too dry, add water, that'll chill it out. Is it just too much manure, too much hot stuff? Yes, add carbon, turn the pile. And then the turning itself is gonna release at least you're going to go down by about 10 degrees per turning so those are your two hot answers what if it's too cold especially if you're trying to do this when the ambient temperature is chilly in the winter or spring is the pile too wet then it has a hard time generating heat 
So let's add some dry stuff. Or worst case scenario is you watch the weather, you take the cover off when it's gonna be nice and sunny, and you come onto the top of the pile and you literally make a divot in it with your loader bucket and like open it up so that it has more sun and air and it can dry off. Too cold or too wet is way worse than anything else. This is too wet. I'm sorry, we're gonna open up the pile if it's too wet. Okay, if it's too cold, we gotta add nitrogen. That means we need more manure. Sorry, I should have put that on the slide. I'll fix it. All right, here's how we're gonna add water. This is the, the water manifold on my turning machine here, and it's putting out a beautiful spray of water as the material is up in the air. It's not just laying water on the top, it's getting it while it's being mixed, which is super cool and makes it work great. Um, I've used this option in an emergency scenario where my ingredients were really dry. It's the middle of summer and as hot as anything outside. I've used tea tape along the piles for a day just to get a lot of water out there. Um, I I'm dragging a hose in this system behind me, a one inch rubber hose, uh, or you could buy this special buggy that rides behind the compost turner. So that's dealing with adding water. And again, well, because we're keeping that covered, we should never have the problem of too much water because we're keeping the rain off. Here's our successful product. Uh, there's a little bit of gravel there that's from the compost pad itself. But otherwise, this is very well broken down compost. There's no wood chips, there's no leaves, there's no sticks, there's nothing, okay? Uh, let me see how we are with time. All right, I'm gonna say hold questions till we get to the end, please. Compost extras. So here's some other stuff that you could put in. You could use microbial inoculants. I never did. Um, but I did do these things. Because I was gonna spread this compost on all my production ground, I added other minerals because I'm, then I don't have to go across the field and make a separate trip. And so for me, I added rock phosphate and I added azomite. Here's some other ingredients that you might consider using. Um, and anytime you put those in the pile, you can do it you know, any time after, any time in the process, I wouldn't do it at the very beginning, but somewhere after it's super hot. Um, and I consider that that makes those amendments biologically charged, it makes them activated. They become incorporated in the bodies of the critters. That's the key. Here's uh, us putting bags of azomite on the top of the pile to mix it in, so then it will make it to the field. Right. Ellen, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to flag that we we still have plenty of time because uh, we're yeah, done until. I was, I was my mind was messing with me about when we were done. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So you feel free to stop for questions if you want. Otherwise, you can keep going. All right. I think I'll stop in just a second. So okay. This is a big deal. When is the compost finished? And for lube keep compost. The answer is it has to be cooler than 90 degrees and the CO2 generation over time over the course of a day or two shouldn't be any higher than 3%, 3 to 6%. If you're not measuring very much, then visually, I would say when you can't tell what the materials were, if you pick that up and it, you can't see a single thing, you can't identify it, then the compost is done. It has transformed. The ingredients have transformed into something else. That's the whole cool thing about compost. So for me, a compost that's full of wood chips is not compost. It's a problem. And I know that's going to piss people off and I know it's a pro I know it's an issue, but in my universe I'm making fertilizer, I'm trying to heal my farm, and a bunch of wood chips is not gonna help. All right, 
let's take that compost and get it out into the field because we're talking about being farmers and integrating compost into our lives. Uh, these top two photographs are from my farm. This is the machine I had. It's called a Stoltzfus. It's called a poultry litter spreader is, how, is what they call it in the literature. And as you can see, it's tractor pulled. It has spinners in the back, much like this one here. This is a picture in almonds in California, organic almonds. Um, here's another weird kind of old time spreader. But the key is we're putting out a very even distribution of a very fine product. So you could never spread my compost with a manure spreader, right? Those ones, the old fashioned ones that just fling everything about. It's too imprecise and the, this material is too fine. It's too, yeah, it just wouldn't work right. So we need a spin spreader for this kind of compost, my kind of compost. And what rate do I do we want to think about putting out? I would say the bare minimum is two tons to the acre. I mean, and that's a rate that we would put lime out, right, on some farms. So that's what I call super fairy dust level. It's two tons to the acre. The most I would consider putting out, and when I never did get anywhere near this, is 60 tons to the acre. And now we're in JM 48's kind of style. And my regular every year rate was 10 tons to the acre and um, trust me while that sounds like a lot 10 tons um you can just see it it's you can't even measure it like you know new time gardeners are putting out one inch two inch three inch four inches of compost this you couldn't measure it it is not even it's probably an eighth of an inch of compost that's 10 tons to the acre. Uh, to put that in terms of yards, um, my compost weighed about 1,200 pounds per yard. It's heavy, heavy and dense. Remember, there's soil in there and it's super fine. Um, so 10 tons would be, what is that? 20,000 pounds. Here, let's do it. 20,000 pounds divided by 1,200 pounds. That's 16 yards per acre. All right, there we go. And what's important from an agronomic perspective is that you don't consider the compost as being the, the whole way you're going to fulfill your nitrogen needs for your crops. If you spread that much compost over and over year after year, you're gonna end up with problems. It's not gonna work. Plus it's really expensive. Cost of producing a 50 ton finished windrow. Remember we talked about that. We took two windrows, we put them together, finish them out at 50 tons. These are you know, mid 20 teens, 2017, 2016 numbers. It's more information than most of you are looking for. So let's just say, go to the bottom. So I'm including labor materials and equipment. So I'm being fairly fair. I didn't, I'm not charging overhead, but the cost for me, $55 a ton or $33 a yard to make Lubke style compost. And that's not cheap. Right, so if I was going to sell this compost and try to make some money on it, I would need to sell it, and I did sell it for seventy-five dollars a ton. If you add those special powders, right, as my kelp or rock phosphate, that's going to change the price significantly, and so that would have to be added in. In other uh, countries in the world that are are more agriculturally advanced than we are including Australia, compost making is fairly common as a service. Someone does it as a service, it's a business, and they will custom blend whatever fertilizer you need for that farm into your compost and then deliver it to you. So each, the, they will custom make your batch of compost with whichever nutrients you are needing from a soil test. We, I don't know, as I don't think I know one single place, I've never heard of anybody ever doing that in the United States. So we got a little ways to go yet. 
Uh, let's let's take. A, I'm going to hang. Leave this right here. And Linda, this is a good place to take any other questions that have come about the making of the pile. All right. Sounds good. Um, I don't know if anybody that custom blends for farm specific needs, but I know that there are a lot of businesses out there that do create soil blends kind of generally for different purposes. So uh -huh. uh, worth looking into that. But um, let's see, there was a question about if you could uh, expand on the role of soil in the compost recipe. Good, uh, I love that. I thought about that one. That, yeah. They think that the fine particles would take up pore space, that it would be too fine, I suppose. Yeah, so the, you know, I'm not a scientist. I haven't done the research. I go to people who are smarter than me and this is what they tell me. So the Lubkeys believe that to make a truly stable finished compost, the clay micelle itself is needed to hook on to the, the humus or whatever you wanna call it. We're not supposed to say humus anymore. Um, that, that, that it was the clay itself that was important in terms of the physical structure of the finished compost. And so for farms that or, or area parts of the country where clay is not even part of their soil, right? They couldn't get clay filled dirt, doesn't exist uh, like ours. They would recommend you actually buy bagged dry kaolinite and spread a little bit of that on the top. So that's how strongly they believed in the clay structure itself. It also turns out that having both the soil and the comp finished compost as ingredients is a kind of buffering agent. It makes the pile less jittery, you know, more calm, less wild swings of temperature, and moisture so it's like it's like having a, an adult in the room with a bunch of kids right and so that's the those are the two avenue reasons why i continued to use soil in the compost great question i know it's very unusual and i think it's so cool okay what else you got so there's some questions about the different feedstocks um, one is about uh, composting meat and bone or uh, mortalities, I suppose, um, do, do those things have to go through a grinder? Mm, I've never worked with mortalities myself, but my compost, my American compost guru, George Leidig, he's been called in to some of these sort of emergency situations like you know, flooding in North Carolina on all these dead hogs and whole chicken houses and all that stuff. And basically whole cows, and they don't grind them up. They just lay them out there and um, like in the, as a layer in the pile, and then they just leave it for a little while, like a few days before they do use the turning machine. And then they go away really, really fast is what I'm told. It works yeah. great. Right. And there's, in Maryland, there's a um, someone who specializes in animal mortality composting at University of Maryland, Gary Felton, uh, cool. who does uh, animal mortality composting specifically. And um, I think it is a months long process, but he definitely has some great resources available, cool. which if we have time, we'll share. Um, okay. And I do see some questions about small scale equipment, like a small scale sifter or skid steer mount, mounted turners and i just want to note that if ellen can address these questions we will try our best to address them in a future webinar potentially the next one on recipe development or in a future webinar specifically focused on small scale equipment because it is such a big need um yeah. for as well as community composters so i don't know if you have any thoughts on either of those things you know i don't it's just not my bailiwick. I you you know you see from these pictures what my experience is. But what? So just to avoid the whole question, or another way to answer that question, which is again controversial and problematic, is to say why don't small farmers get together 
and and designate one of them as the composter for the group everybody invests in an actual set of equipment at an actual site and and they pay whoever that is to make the compost for everybody right instead of everyone having to own all of these pieces of equipment on their own so it just doesn't um it just doesn't make sense to spend a, a whole lot of money on equipment if you're not going to make a lot of product is what i'm saying does that make sense yeah, yeah. no definitely and i have i know um in maryland for example some uh, counties, for example, offer uh, tool share programs. Um, the Office of Agriculture in Montgomery County does this. Uh, and, you know, if farmers demand or ask for uh, equipment related to composting, uh, perhaps, you know, if they, if they can show demand, perhaps uh, those kind of, that kind of equipment could be purchased for those purposes. So, yeah, but I, I totally get that what, what I'm showing you is a pain in the neck and most people don't want to do it they don't want to spend the time they don't want to spend the money they don't want to buy the equipment they don't want to do any of it um the real thing and then i say well then why i don't know then why bother like that's how it is for me like either i'm gonna do it really good or i'm just not gonna do it right i'll just buy it from somebody else and let them worry about it and the other reason why i was really excited about doing it is because there was nobody to get it from and and you know again that was back in the 90s at this point there are some composts available commercially the quality of them is still not great and if you want a quality compost you're gonna have to pay dearly for it you know, I know a farmer here in Maryland who bought compost out of Pennsylvania, exactly like mine, same style of compost as, as what I'm describing here. And I think it was $150 a yard. It was a lot. Okay. Um, and then delivered from Pennsylvania to Maryland. So, in, so that's an impetus to, to, to learn how to make your own is that there are no great options out there um we can get into all kinds of questions about you know chemical contamination of ingredients you know i'm using uh yard waste or leaves from this from the city are they full of cadmium and 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 pesticides and to that i would say yeah, the world is got pollution in it. <laughs> and there is no such thing as pristine ingredients. And, and to that end, I trust that because I'm doing such a good process, that the biology is gonna clear it up. The only case where that doesn't work is that contaminated hay that comes from the clopyrrolids right, that we've talked about in the mulching world, right, this herbicide carryover on certain hay, even composting doesn't fix it. But what you need to know is that in this, in, there's a weird little business in the world called soil remediation, like they take poisoned soil from chemical spills and, you know, gas leaks and so forth. And what they do is they take the soil out and they compost with it and then it's fixed. So we know that biology can fix almost everything, right? Bacteria and fungi have an amazing ability to either chelate or to transform funky ingredients they come up towards. Okay, that was a, I went off on a thing. That's what happens when you tell me we got time. That's great. Uh, one one final question or one comment from me any the questions relating to uh composting feedstocks and uh recipe development i'm going to go ahead and punt you direct you to the next webinar which is going to do a deep dive yeah. on that topic just so we can focus uh, more on uh some of the integrating composting into a farming business questions and one of the main questions that i'm hearing and i don't know if this is going to still come up um ellen is 
is there a way so the Lupke method of composting is sort of like uh, the ultimate in my perspective and uh, you know it's it's a gold standard um, yes. sort of for on composting do you have any thoughts on like how it could be scaled down no <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to take out the turning machine because if you take out the turning machine then you're not going to turn it and then if you're not going to turn it it's not going to be aerobic and if it's not aerobic it's not going to be compost at least not on any time scale that's that's soon so that's the problem you know i mean people most farmers that are making compost are not using a turning machine and they're you know they put stuff together and they let's it's over there and now maybe i'll turn it twice you know with with a loader bucket or something and so the way you make up for uh, having good equipment is with time you just let stuff sit for a year or more and then eventually like biology will win and it will turn into something else i just didn't i couldn't imagine doing that on my scale on a smaller scale and that's what i tell growers that i work with now if the only kind of compost they can get their hands on is crap then buy it six months before you want to use it and just age it on your property especially if it's full of woody materials which are going to be problematic for growing annual crops so that's my half-assed answer to your good question. No, it's a it's a it's a very fair um, response, especially when you are your goal is to create really great compost um, for your soil. Yeah. Um, I think that potentially in the next session uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the importance of recipe in terms of what materials you can put into your comp. Like if you don't have uh, money for like a turner, you're what you put into your composting recipe is ever more important because you'll have to balance out materials that provide airspace in your pile and so on. And then uh, other systems potentially are out there like- uh, Right, the four stairs. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, so that this seems is, like a more appropriate mm -hmm. avenue of inquiry uh, for you know people who just wanna make you know 20 or 100 yards a year, something like that, exactly. All right, Great. let's okay. get on to some other things. Okay, uh, we've already talked about this, so, but why would I prefer the use of compost versus just buying fertilizer in a bag? And, you know, what am I going to say? I, it's like the best, you know, like who doesn't want chocolate cake, you know, instead of like flour and sugar? Like I want chocolate cake, and that's what really good compost is. It's got biology it's got the nutrients and it's got the the beautiful very well broken down humus like material shall we say why wouldn't you want to use compost or make compost it's expensive it takes a lot to get your infrastructure going you've got to spread it you've got to have some kind of a of device equipment to spread the compost itself maybe there's materials are not available to you then it's going to take time and then i don't want to you know and that's a really good reason not to do composting is because you just don't want to it doesn't match your temperament you got to really want to do this because it's a pain in the neck right but i tell you what it is magical to to be witness to that transformation and again on such a fast time scale to go from literal stinking shit piles to that handful of beautiful compost in eight weeks dude that is magic it is fun okay Here's some talk about, just a, a slide about what else is out there, what to worry about. This is buying compost, right? Which we were just about, we were just talking about. Not all compost is created equal, right? There's, there are some guidelines from the US Composting Council that a compost should fit within these parameters. If you ask me, 
the parameters are extremely wide. Like you could drive six semis in between the range that they say compost should be for, for the various parameters. I think it's because um, I see some really bad compost out there and it's and it has the seal of approval from the from the composting council. And the main issue that we're worried about, we've already talked about that whole wood chip thing, is this anaerobic. We really don't want to have the results of an anaerobic compost or an anaerobic decomposition as a fertilizer, right? Because the, the byproducts of rotting are not plant-friendly chemicals. They have names like cadaverins and formaldehydes, right? That's what you get from an anaerobic uh, decomposition process. And that does not make fertilizer, okay? Um, unfinished compost can be toxic to plants. So it could be so hot, it could be hot in the terms of temperature, it could be hot in terms of nitrogen, that it's actually going to you know, end up killing your plants. Or it could be so fresh that um, it, the plant, your plant is just, the biology is not going to talk to your plants at all. They're busy dealing with this tremendous amount of fresh material that you just put in. All right. How can you evaluate compost that you buy? Maybe I'm not supposed to really talk about this, but let's do it anyway. So, go for it. Go for it. yeah, I want you to get a test. They should have a compost test. If they don't, I'm already suspicious that they know what they're doing. And if you really want to work with these people, then you go get a compost test. Go get a Ziploc bag full and send it in. It costs you 75 bucks, not cheap. And then you're going to have to hire somebody to help you look at it, or you're going to have to get really smart about what are you looking at when the test comes back. I look at compost tests all from all over the country as I work with my grower clients because they I help them go shopping and decide which compost they should buy. If you can't get any analysis you're in for some reason or other, then what does it look like? What does it smell like? Is it steamy and hot? Is it um if it smells bad, it is bad. The nose is a really, really good sensor for whether compost is good and broken down, right? The critters that come from an aerobic decomposition process smell good. It should smell earthy. And then maybe that's a, a slide that I don't have, is that compost cover that we talked about is really gonna help with odor control as well. But I'm telling you what, I am telling you what, you make that pile and 36 hours later, that stinky shit does not stink anymore. And it won't stink the whole rest of the time because I'm turning it and keeping it aerobic. Aerobic decomposition smells good. It's when the oxygen is missing and then you're rotting stuff, that's what doesn't smell good. So use your nose. And then, of course, as much as you can, talk to the people who make it and have them describe what they're using and what the process is. So here's a photograph that came from a, a customer of mine out in Colorado in this case. And she contacted me because this was her first crop on some new property. And she said, oh, I put out this beautiful compost but look at my plants. She's a cut flower grower. She planted like everybody's talking about on this no-till gardening business. She, she put it, her plants into straight compost. Now, look at this picture. Like, I don't know, I see a lot of stuff that doesn't look broken down. Sticks, pieces of wood, pieces of straw, I don't know. And this is what happens when you put plants into straight compost that's not great compost, which basically almost is unavailable. 
So it is not soil. It is not a replacement for soil. It's an amendment. So if you're gonna buy whatever crap compost is available to you, you better either age it like crazy on your farm or at least please mix it into your soil with a tiller. And then you have compost mixed with soil and you won't end up likely with plants that look like this. Okay. Let's um, let's just mention these legal considerations because this is a sitch, right? So again, I was in Loudoun County, Virginia, just outside Washington, DC. Before I went into making my compost, I went to my, you know, guys at the county that were pro-ag guys, you know, in economic development. And I was like, what does it mean if I want to make compost on my farm? Am I gonna get in trouble with anybody? And they said, as long as you're not charging tipping fees and all you're doing is making compost for your own use, nobody cares. Do whatever you want. You're just a farmer doing farm stuff. But if you are charging people to dump waste on your property, then you are a waste handling facility. And now you're gonna get regulations like crazy, which of course is a good idea because who wants to have an unregulated dump next to them? Um, and so this is something that you, if you are gonna sell compost in any quantity or you're thinking about tipping fees, anyway, you need to check out your zoning situation in your area. If you're just gonna manage, you know, a little bit of stuff on your farm and it's just for you, nobody's gonna care. But if, you, if this is gonna become a real business, you better find out what the legal situation is in your area. Okay, and I threw this in at the last minute. How do you get this work done while you're farming? Because I finally looked again at the title of this whole thing, which was called integrating composting into your farm. And the answer is, choose the time of year that you're gonna concentrate on making your piles, right? And so for me, I did them in this kind of in the sweet spot. I didn't do a lot of composting in the early spring. It's too wet, I'm too busy doing other stuff. I did it when it was nice weather, in the middle of the season, even when there's lots of harvesting to do. And I never composted in the winter time. In the winter, I took off, okay, that's vacation. Of course, train other people how to do the work or make sure they can do all the other stuff while you're tending to the compost. And then the key piece is this, and this is what, what Mrs. Lupke told me and told us in our class. Set everything up right from the beginning so that you will always make the right choice about whether to turn the pile or not. If turning the pile is a huge pain in the neck and unpleasant and takes forever, you're gonna say, oh, they're probably fine for another day. I'll come back tomorrow. If it's really easy to do, the water's there, the tractor is easy to hook up to the equipment, everything is functioning properly and is well-maintained, it's then you're gonna say, Yes, the compost told me it's out of oxygen. I'm going to go turn it because that's my job. That's what I do. You have to buy in, you have to believe, and you have to want to take care of those livestock, right? Can you imagine going to visit your chickens and you see that all the watering, all the waterers are empty and you say, eh, I don't feel like it today right? I'm going to come back tomorrow and get some water. It's too much of a pain, right? So you've got to set it up right so it's easy to do the right thing. All right, go forth and compost. That's the end of the slides. Let me uh, see. We do have some questions, of course, um, and I can, I just want to comment that I really wish that I could be connecting you all so you could be chatting with each other. And this, I think, is a sign that we need more of this kind of discussion. 
um because i have a lot of good chat uh, or things coming in via chat um but a question uh, questions relating to compost testing and so on we will have a couple of sessions that touch on this coming in the future but there was a question about which lab only costs or charges $75 for compost test analysis. Yeah, I, I work with Midwest Labs in Nebraska and they charge $75 for a pretty good compost test. But there's a lot of labs out there. I just, I've never shopped around to see how much they cost. Right. I think Penn State also does something around Penn that State same. Does, um, lots of people do them. Some of them are crappy results. I really, I just like working with Midwest. Um, yeah. I remember there was a question earlier that said, do I have anything to say about the results of all of this composting on my farm? Which is, of course, a really good question. And again, I'm not a scientist. And so I didn't run my farm like a research farm with, with data and you know uh, what are, control fields. But I'm just going to tell you that it got better and better and better over time. And of course, composting wasn't the only thing I was doing, though, right? I'm doing all kinds of cover cropping. I'm doing the vacation plan where every field is on vacation every other year. So I was doing a lot of things at the same time. And so it's hard for me to, I couldn't possibly say the compost did this, right? Just like Arjun who we heard from at the early beginning of this webinar said, farmers do things in bundles. We very rarely just choose one practice and, and nothing else. And so all I can tell you is $400,000 off of 10 acres on a, a fairly extensive scale, right? That doesn't compare to, you know, Ben Hartman or, or Connor Crickmore in terms of dollars per square inch. But if you're farming in an acre scale, uh, $40,000, $45,000 an acre, something's going pretty good out there. Okay, what else you got? Great, uh, so uh, just wanna mention that a future session, I keep saying this, but uh, the session on compost and soil health, we will hopefully be hearing from a researcher who's looking at different types of compost and their specific soil health benefits so uh, for that um, and there's some great comments um, Keith Olinger in the chat thank you Keith as mentioning at least in Maryland uh, regulations dictate uh, things like pile height and pile length and um, and also I know uh, this yes if you're only composting materials that you produced on farm and using the compost on farm Hopefully that will keep you from being noticed by your neighbors, but that's not necessarily the case in every neighborhood. So um, that's just something to be to be yeah. aware of what regulations the, are. The main thing being, that's going to get you noticed is things stinking. And so there's another reason to do an excellent job with composting. So turning the pile smells good. It smells like like digging into beautiful soil. It's like, oh, that smells like health. It doesn't ever smell like poop. So, yeah. Yes. Watch out for That's the smell. Not, for sure. Um, the, I guess the final question that I'll leave you with, um, Dr. Rink in his presentation talked about how it could take months to produce uh, or to get through the active phase of composting. And you're talking about eight to 10 weeks. Yep. Can you? address how that yep, happens so fast. It's all about your ingredients and your method. So he's talking about, he's most of his recipes probably had wood chips in them. So if you, once you take wood chips out of the system, you're gonna go fast. And, you, and this turning, 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 I'm never gonna let those guys die, right? I'm just keep giving oxygen so that the pile just keeps on going whether that's turning or whether that's blowing, and to have all your ingredients very well mixed and very fine, you know, in small pieces. You know, you saw I threw in a few boxes and, you know, big stuff, but not mostly. Mostly the biggest thing would be 
a, you know, a piece of, of hay or straw. That's not very big. And it breaks up as soon as the turner comes. So yeah, that's, that's this whole problem that we have about talking about compost is that that word comprises so many things. You know, everybody has their own definition of what is compost. You know, in, and I'm, I'm not saying this to be disrespectful, but I remember somebody asking the Lukies, well, what do you think about vermicompost? And they said, it's a really great ingredient for compost. It's not compost itself, it's poop, but it's really, really great ingredient. <laughs> And so, you know, it's just like, well, who, who's asking, you know, like that. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much, Ellen. I don't know if you have any final thoughts to share. No, I think I, think I got plenty of thoughts out there. I'm happy to, to work with anybody on getting a system set up, but I don't, like I said, I don't know about those blowers. I just know what I showed you today. That's what I know about. Yes, and you know it very well. So thank you, Ellen, and thank you all for participating and uh, hope you join us for a future session. So have a great rest of the day. Take care, everybody.